Today is uh, our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Van Wu, who is now a of Smith Professor at the year, to visit us and uh, give a distinguished talk on random matrices. So, Professor Van Wu is like an uh, old friend of mine, and uh, we have known each other for more than 10 years, but we haven't uh, seen each other for a while. So, I do admire him a lot, and he has made a significant contribution to mathematics, especially on uh, additive combinatorics and uh, random matrices. This, uh, this you can see from his uh, career path. For example, he just did a two years post at Microsoft, and then only did a two years tenure track since a professor at UCSD, and then got promoted just out of two years, and then become associate professor, and two years later, still promoted to be full professor, and then three years later, he's as a distinguished professor at Rutgers, and then three years later, he's at, uh, you know, uh, P.F. Smith's professor at the year, so I do admire him quite a lot. Yeah, by the way, so he's a speaker of ICM in 2014 in Seoul, and he won, he won a focus on prize from MS and the Mass Optimization Society and the Georgia Polia Prize from SIME, and he has published 150 papers and more than thousands of uh, citations, okay? And uh, I met him recently after many years in Singapore. It was a surprise. And I ran him in NUS, and then I found out why he's there, right? And then since uh, I knew him, like visiting there for, for a year, and uh, I dragged him here to give a distinguished lecture here. I say I dragged him because first, he, uh, he's injured, he has some leg problems, so he apologized, he had to sit to give the lecture. Uh, I appreciate this very much. And also, I know we have uh, many audience for this talk, so I drag him here because, you know, the room is basically packed. So this is pretty uh, amazing for a math talk, you know. <laughs> so, okay, so now the rest of the time, we uh, invite Professor Wu to give a talk on random matrices. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, the invitation to be here at uh, ICA USD. Uh, it's my pleasure to be in Hong Kong again. And, as my friend told me, I was here 20 years ago. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, so it's a very introductory talk about random matrices, which is uh, seems to be a hot topic nowadays for various reasons. Uh, so I guess everybody took linear algebra, so we just assume what we know what a matrix is. So in this talk, I just focus on square matrices, so uh, n by n matrix. Um, and for a matrix, we usually, what we do in linear algebra is that we want to calculate the parameters of this, like the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and the determinant and so on and so forth, right? So that's what we do in, in linear algebra 101. So the word random means that your matrix now come from some random source, some distribution. And now everything you wanted to compute, such as the, the eigenvalues or the eigenvectors or the determinant, they become a random variable, right? And uh, we just wa want to understand the distribution of these random variables. So that is the mathematical purpose of the whole theory. And at the end, uh, I will sketch uh, a few applications and connections to other fields of mathematics. Okay, so the model I have today is the simplest model uh, among, uh, you know, distributions of random matrices. We just consider uh, matrices with uh, independent entries, right? So you have n square entries, and all of them are independent random variables with the same distribution. Now, of course, there will be symmetry inside the matrix, so we know there's a symmetric matrices and Hermitian matrices. It's very important classes in, in, in linear algebra. And in this case, of course, the entries have to have correlation, like the AI, J have to be AJI. Um, and, and so we have to carry this uh, symmetry in the model. And when I say the IID model, then there's no symmetry, we just have N square random bits. Okay, and, and we also normalize everything, so any entries would have been zero and variance one. Just normalization. Okay, and uh, please feel free to stop me whenever you have questions because I want the, at least the first half of the talk to be uh, understandable to everybody. Uh, well, even that you took linear and chapter one hundred and one. Uh, okay, so uh, there's some example here. 
uh, one of the most examined class of random matrices is when the random variable is Gaussian. Uh, either complex Gaussian, or then uh, in that case, you have something called the GUE ensemble. If it is a real Gaussian, then you have something called GOE ensemble. You don't have to remember these letters. Uh, and those are for the Hermitian and symmetric case. If they are the IID model, they call the Ginebra model. So, so these are the things that uh, people like a lot because they are easy to study. Another model is also simple to keep in mind is that when the entries are just coin flip, right? So for every entry, you flip a coin and write, write one or minus one accordingly. So it's another distribution of random matrices, right? Yeah, so the big picture is the following. So I will go through the, the, the theory part first, that when we want to study the eigenvalues or the, the eigenvectors of these matrices, what people do is the following. Well, they first compute this distribution in the Gaussian model. The Gaussian model has uh, some very special property because Gaussian is uh, rotational invariance. So it allows us to compute distribution of the eigenvalues very precisely and also distribution of the eigenvectors very precisely. You know exactly what they are. And now you do experiment uh, to see what other ensembles produce. Right? So eigenvalues are very easy to compute, so you can input a plus minus one matrix and see if the statistic match the Gaussian case. And they seem to match numerically. Uh, so that's that phenomenon is called the universality phenomenon, namely that the output doesn't really depend on the, in, on the distribution of the input. Right? So if you want to compute the determinant of the matrix, then actually it doesn't matter which randomness you started with, the result will be the same. Now it sounds a little bit fancy, but all of us have heard about things like that in other parts of mathematics or in probability. Uh, one famous thing is the central limit theorem, right? The central limit theorem is that you have a bunch of IID random variable, you add them up, and you divide it by square root n or some normalization factor. And what you see is that this sum will satisfy, uh, this sums will have Gaussian distribution. And no matter which kind of random variable you add it in the beginning, so this is exactly the same phenomenon, just in much more complicated setting, that no matter which kind of random matrix you start with, when you compute the eigenvalues or the determinant or the eigenvectors, they tend to give the same distributions. So the main, the main part of the talk will be resolved to sort of, you know, um, illustrate this phenomenon. And among all the and among all the interesting models, actually Bernoulli model seems to be a very good toy model. So when you can do solve the problem for this model, you have a very good idea to solve the problem for any other model. So, yeah, so that is what I write here. That uh, I will present many results in conjecture with the Bernoulli model because they are easy to state, but the same hold in, in more general settings. Yeah, and then the bunch of, there's like at least two dozen other models people use in probability or physical, uh, mathematical physics or statistics that I, I will not discuss, but, uh, but many of the results also hold in these uh, cases. Okay, so first thing, uh, we want to understand the global distribution. Now you take a Hermitian or symmetric matrix uh, we know that all the eigenvalues are real, right? So that's again something from linear algebra. Um, now the eigenvalues are real, so you have n numbers on the real line. And you want to know what the limiting distribution is. Now one thing you see is that if your matrix is mn and n increase, then the eigenvalue also get bigger and bigger, right? But you want to talk about limiting distribution, then you have to scale them down somehow in order to, you know, you have to, they should have the common support at the end. And it turns out that the right scaling is order square root n. 
if you scale the matrix by square root n, actually all the eigenvalues become bounded. Not only they become bounded, they seem to be become bounded between minus 2 and 2. And here is a limiting distribution of the density function. So um, all this n number is not uniformly distributed between 2, minus 2, and 2, but they have the density function, which is semicircle. Namely, that if you want to know the number of eigenvalues between, say, 1.5 and 2, then you integrate the part of the semicircle function over this interval between 1.5 and 2. Right. So you, you can see less eigenvalue here than the number of eigenvalue in the middle. Right. So they are not uniformly distributed. This was discovered by Wigner in the 1950s, and that's called the Wigner semicircle law. That, uh, that actually one of the starting point of random matrix theory. Wigner was a physicist, actually. He was not a mathematician, man. and he was interested in random matrix because for some very specific reason that the eigenvalues, why they form a random boy process on, on the real line, the randomness here have very special feature, namely that the eigenvalue close to each other. They seem to repel each other. For instance, if I tell you there's a eigenvalue of 0 0.5, then actually the probability that you find another value near 0 0.5 will drop dramatically. So it will not be like a Poisson process when one point do not affect each other. Here the eigenvalues do want, they, they want to stay apart. So that's why Wigner uh, was interested in that because uh, Particle in physics actually do have this property. Uh, okay, so this is about symmetric inhibition case when we know that the eigenvalues are real. Uh, now, if you omit that, omit that condition, then the eigenvalues are mostly complex, right? And the conjecture there was that this complex number. Um, also normalized by square root n as before, uh, we inform a distribution which is uniform on the unit circle. That's called the circular law conjecture uh, form in, I think, was first uh, pronounced uh, raised in the 1960s. And it was proved recently, about 10 years ago. Uh, um, so there's a long and this thing is actually much harder than this case. This case was proved by Wigner himself also in 1950s. Um, so there's nothing left to prove about global distribution. This conjecture actually has been considered by a number of people, and they proved, uh, you know, some special case, Gaussian case, as I said, and then some extended to a bigger and bigger ensemble and. And it was finally done with full generality by Terence Tao and me, actually exactly 10 years ago. Uh, and then there's a lot of following work that extended into matrices with dependent entries, but I will not go into them. So, so this, yeah, so that's uh, what you want to know, oh, you want to know about global, semicircle, and circular. And in the rest of the talk, I've been talk about like local, density. So how does, yeah, here for instance is what I zoom in this picture near the red line and you want to see that, okay, so how do you have this distribution? How does this, how do these eigenvalues interact with each other? Oh, okay. Any questions so far? All right. So the first question is that, okay, what about the individual eigenvalues? So if I give you eigenvalues Number five, lambda five, right? So let's say that we are consider the symmetric case here. You have n real eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda n. And I order them. So lambda one is bigger than lambda two, bigger than lambda n. And I give you an index, say lambda i. So lambda n over three, for instance, something in the middle. You want to know the, the distribution of that, this very specific lambda. So quite surprisingly, about 10 years ago, Gustafsson managed to compute this. 
He looked at the GUE model, namely a random Hermitian matrix with Gaussian entry. So it's a complex Gaussian entry. And he can show that actually the individual lambda, at least for older i between uh, um, in the middle, in the bulk of the entries, satisfy the central limit theorem. It comes as a su surprise because central limit theorem is about adding things, right? Adding randomness together, and then you normalize it, and then you have you have Gaussian distribution. That's like the law of nature. And this lambda, you, you see this lambda, you don't add anything. Still, you have this, and, and it was surprising. And you can prove similar result for the joy distribution of eigenvalues, say, if you care about lambda of n over 3 and lambda of n over 2. So you have a vector of length 2, and the joy distribution of this vector is also Gaussian. Yeah, so let me talk now about universality, because here you start to see the pattern that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Namely, usually people something proof for the Gaussian case first. Because actually, the way Gustafsson did it is that he just compute this thing exactly. Um, and now, yeah, you can ask, what happens if I have a, you know, Bernoulli matrix or some other matrix? Can you still see this Gaussian uh, limit at the end? Yes, yeah, so here's the one big theorem that uh, I want to introduce that has sort of underlined many other theorems in this talk. I say we have a definition. Uh, I say two random matrices match to the order k if the first k moments of the entries are the same. So what is the first moment of the entry? The first moment is the expectation. Right? And we assume that they are zero. So they always match up to the first uh, moment. The second moment of the entry is the variance of that entry. Right? We also assume that it has unit variance. So, so they also always match the first two moments. And if the third moment is uh, the same or the th fourth moment is the same, then they, they, we say that they are matching up to the fourth moments. So the theorem says the following. If you have matrices matched to the fourth moment, so the, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth are the same, and regardless the rest of the distribution, then the joy distribution of any k values are absolutely the same. Right? So namely, this theorem will hold for any ensemble of matrices when you have the first four moment matching the Gaussian. For instance, if you know the real Gaussian, then the first moment is zero, second moment is one, third moment is zero, and the fourth moment is or well, real Gaussian random variable. What is the fourth moment? Three, right? So if you take any entries with these properties and make a random matrix out of it, then it satisfies the limiting law. Now you can again as an as a, a as a sem, uh, as a, a simple simpler thing to keep in mind. You can compare with the central limit theorem. Right? Central limit theorem meaning say that if you have variable matching the first two moments, right? Then actually they some satisfy the same law. So for central limit theorem, you need only two moments. For this, you need four. Yeah, now of course, the question is that do we really need four? Yes? Is the fourth moment, do you think, necessary here? Okay, so the question here, right? So I couldn't handle the Bernoulli matrix. So Bernoulli have plus minus one entry, right? Apparently, the first moment is zero. Second moment is one. Third moment is zero. What is the fourth moment? They have plus minus one go flip. What is the fourth moment? It's one, right? So one to the fourth is one, and minus one to the fourth is one. Each of them have probability half. So it doesn't match the Gaussian up to the fourth moment. So the, our theorem doesn't apply. 
may be still true i don't know the numerical experiment suggests that some it may be true uh, that's an open question so we don't know this we do have something some conjecture saying that maybe the fourth moment does matter in some that mat does matter in some in some experiment or in some parameter so the the conjecture we have is the following if you look at the expectation of the eigenvalue it okay forget everything <laughs> it's, uh, 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 the first term is that is not random the first two terms are not random and the fourth moment appear in the third term and it says something and it appear with the coefficient depend on i so it says something like if I increase the fourth moment, then some lambda i are shift to the left according to this thing is negative or positive. Some of the lambda i will go to the left, and actually some other lambda i go to the right. So it's some 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 kind of eigenvalue dance is very interesting. So if I increase the fourth moment of the random variable when keeping the other moments, then maybe half of the eigenvalue go to the right a little bit and the other half go to the left so so um, we come up with this conjecture uh, by some experiment but we don't know how to prove it either okay so now let me talk a little bit about correlation functions which is a slightly uh, technical uh, but uh, not really so correlation function is a tool to measure the interaction between nearby eigenvalues. So as I said before, Wigner and other physicists. Yeah, so the correlation function is uh, by letter k here. That means we want to see that how k eigenvalue, which are close to each other, interact. Um, and, uh, uh, and the definition is just something like this. If k is equal to 1, and I just, and usually f is a test function. You can think of f as an indicator of some, of some domain, right? So if lambda depend, uh, uh, is on this domain, f equal to one and lambda is not in the domain, then f of lambda equals zero. So if you integrate f with the first correlation function, then you just have the expectation of the number of eigenvalue in f. So actually the first uh, correlation function is just the, the density function of the eigenvalues. The second one is more interesting, namely that you can take f to be the indicator of a rectangle. So you, you know you want one eigenvalue in i and the other is in j. Then actually the correlation function when we was the expectation of the number of pair i j. So that lambda i is in i, lambda j in j. So if you can measure this value, then you know that how the eigenvalue in i interact with the eigenvalue in j. So very roughly, you don't have to follow the formula. They are sort of ugly. Um, yeah, so for this, you can compute the distribution of the number of eigenvalue in short interval. Yeah, so again, um, people computed in the Gaussian case, and a lot of famous physicists did that, Goda and Me Meta, Dyson, who was at the, yeah, it was the, his team around at the IAS in Princeton, Tracy and Widom, um, and they can compute it in the Gaussian case, exactly, so they have formula for this uh, correlation function, which is ten, well, quite amazingly, tend to be a deter determinant of some matrices. Yeah, so the big question here is that, again, right, the same phenomenon you saw before, we computed something for the Gaussian case. Is it true that, that we can do it for the uh, other distribution? And in that case, uh, there are a lot of universality results, and they, they uh, build up to the complete solution of this problem. So long, about 16 years ago, Johansson, prove that you don't need to be Gauss, you just have to be, need to be Gauss divisible. Gauss divisible is the following. You take any matrix, random matrix, and you take a linear combination of that with the Gaussian matrix. 
So you can have say half Bernoulli plus half of Gaussian. That's the Gauss divisible model. And in the linear combination, you need to have uh, you know uh, each of them have a, a constant portion. So now about uh, six or seven years ago, uh, Terry Tao and I and also a team of Edwish and Yao proved the universality for Hermitian matrices. And then for the symmetric matrices, we prove it, but only under the four moment assumption. So in this result, you don't need the four moment, you only need the first and the second moment to be zero and one. And now, like two years ago, Bogart and, and uh, Yash, Edwish, Yao and Yin uh, complete the proof that they can also do the symmetric case as well. So, so this problem is solved completely. Let me tell you the reason how, uh, let me tell you the sketch of the proof, how these steps work. So the four moment theorem, uh, I just show you, actually imply a four moment theorem for the correlation function. The four moment theorem for the individual diagonal value is a stronger theorem that you can imagine, and you can use it to, to, to have implication on all other statistics. But the four moment theorem need four moment assumption. So you have this map, you, you know something is for Gaussian, then you will know the same thing whole for the class of matrices when the third moment is zero and the fourth moment is three. Right. That's it. And now I look at the other picture. I also extend this no Gaussian to the Gauss divisible. That's a Johansson result, right? So we I can match this way and you can also match that way. So you can match to the left and you can match up. So now we can match both left and up because in the Johansson model allow the third moment to be zero, but the fourth moment can be anything because you can take any random matrix and add to it a Gaussian component. So you, the third moment is still zero, but then the fourth moment can be any number. So by this, we extend our theorem to the bigger class when, when you can ignore the fourth moment. So that was what Terry and I already did in 2009. Now, how to extend, how to actually delete this third moment is need a refinement of Johansson. It was done by Edwish and other people in 2010. Namely, in the Gauss divisible model, they managed to push the Gauss part to be very small. So before I said you can take 50% of any matrices and 50% of Gaussian. But now you can take 99% of any matrices and take only 1% Gaussian. And that 1% is actually a negative power of n. So it's quite amazing that you just add a, neat, a very little Gaussian noise to the matrix and you already have the property you like. Now you have a bigger class, right? And now you can match the bigger class to the whole thing. And so in 2011, I, uh, Terry and I can only need the, the complex scale, Hermitian complex scale, because the, the Edwish uh, arrow result only work for the complex matrices. So, and recently, they found a proof that work for proving this n to the minus C result for both complex and symmetric. So now you automatically have the whole picture. So that is the, the step of this. Uh, it's considered a big uh, conjecture in mathematical physics. Yeah, but it's how the concept works. Okay, now let's. Okay, so something here is also a related problem. Let me go back to this picture of the semicircle law. Oh, that's a lot of pictures. Uh, okay, you see the semicircle law here. <coughs> now, semicircle law, as I said before, if I care about the interval from 1.5 to 2, then the number of eigenvalues in this interval is the integration of, of this semicircle function over that interval. And it is true if I take any interval of constant length. That's what Wigner proved. What about if I take an interval much smaller of length depending on n? Is this thing true? 
So that is something we call the local semicircle law, namely that we want the semicircle law to hold at a much smaller scale, right? Yeah. So here let i be an interval, and i can be very short, as I said. It, it may not be a constant. And we want the number of eigenvalue in i to match. Well, this thing is exactly the integration I told you. And I want the arrow term to be very small. So in expectation, it will be n times the length of i and times some arrow precision delta. So delta, you can think of 1%. So you want this to make a 1% arrow term. OK, so of course, what we want is that how small can i be in order to, to make this thing true, right? Uh, and there are limit to everything. You can make not i arbitrarily small. Um, so this local thing was first considered by Adler, Schlen, and Yao. Um, and they could prove something like you can take the length to be log n to some power, and the power c here is never computed exactly, but it, it, if you follow, the proof is something like a thousand. So remember, uh, the length of the whole spectrum is from minus 2 to 2. And here we talk about the length which is uh, 1 over n times a log factor. There are evidence that you cannot go below a log power because in the Gaussian case, Benarus and Bogart show that if you look at the gap between the consecutive eigenvalues, right? so you have n eigenvalues between minus 2 and 2, so the average gap is almost 1 over n, right? or maybe 4 over n. You have n minus 1 gap. The lambda i plus 1 minus lambda i. And they found out that in the Gaussian case, the biggest gap is not of order 1 over n, it's of order square root of n over n. So now, of course, it has to be a little bit bigger than the average. And it is a square root n factor bigger. So that means you cannot expect this local law go below square root of n over n because in this case, we know that there's a place when this thing is 0. Right. And then you cannot. You, you cannot approximate it by the integration at all. So the result here is sort of nice because it's already close to matching it. Just the only problem is that C here is like 2,000. And it is not because that we are not careful. It's because of the nature of the proof doesn't get anything better. So about two years ago, well, it's a work in the long process. Uh, uh, Ki Wang and me, so Ki was my student at, at Rutgers, and she's here now. Uh, we can reduce it to just log n over n. So it's a square root gap between this uh, and this. And sub Gaussian means that the entry can be anything with the sub Gaussian tail, namely that uh, it have a, a light tail. And we could check sure that square root, actually, the square root log n is the right bound. Yeah, we don't know how to prove that either. OK, so now let me go for the, um, the IID case. Namely, there's no symmetry in this matrix. Uh, you have just n square random bits in the matrix, and, and they are independent. And as we know, the must eigen value are complex. But one surprising thing is that if the matrix is real, namely the, the entries are real, then there are many real eigenvalues. Right. You can easily prove that there's at least one real eigenvalue because if you take n to be odd and look at the characteristic polynomial of the matrix, then you have a polynomial of odd degree. And if the, if the entries are real, then the coefficient of this polynomial is real. And the polynomial of odd degree with real coefficient does have one, at least one real root. Well, but in the truth, they have much more. So again, people look at the Gaussian model. So it's the work of several guys here. 
and they find out the exact order of magnitude of the real roots. So there are square root n of them multiplied by a constant factor of square root 2 over pi. Now how the pi comes here is a long story. But this, this can be computed exactly. Yeah, and, uh, and also people compute the correlation function. This is really messy. This is uh, it's the whole literature on this. Now, uh, okay, so after 2009, uh, Terry and I, uh, okay, think that, okay, now we finished the, the symmetric case. What can we do with the, this non-symmetric case here? And we apply the method that we do for symmetric matrices, and it failed totally. Because the method, what we did with symmetric matrix, based on the fact that the spectrum of the symmetric matrix is very stable under small perturbation. If you perturb the entries of a symmetric matrix a little bit, the eigenvalue do not change too much. But if, if you perturb the matrix, there are, there are non-symmetric matrices such that if you perturb the entry just slightly, something like 1 over n, then the whole um, the whole spectrum change completely. So let me show at least one proof in this talk, and that's the proof of this fact. Uh, let me take this matrix. So it have 0 everywhere, except it have 1 here, just above the diagonal. Now, of course, the whole eigenvalue of this guy are 0. Right. You can see that the, the characteristic polynomial just lambda to the n. Now let me add an epsilon here. So epsilon is 1 over n 100. Now the characteristic polynomial will be lambda to the n minus its epsilon. It's again very easy to compute. Right? So the minus epsilon comes from the product of O of this times this. And if you see, if I take epsilon to be 1 over n to the 100, then actually lambda will be basically the root of unity very close to the root of unity. So the spectrum going from one single boy at zero to the root of unity uniform on the circle. So that means this matrix is, is very sensitive. And that was the hard thing to deal with. Nonetheless, uh, we developed a new method called proving universality via sampling. And it allows us to prove uh, universality of the correlation functions under the four moments, so it's again a four moment theorem. But here there's no machinery to reduce this four to two as before. There's no result for Gauss divisible uh, matrices and things like that. We don't have this sequence of picture that I showed you before. Here, four is four, and we don't know how to, um, yeah, we don't know how to improve that. So again, the question is that what can you do if you have only three moments as manually matrices match it the option only three moments? Okay. For instance, I talked about the ring root before. Now if I have four moments, the same result on the ring root hold. If I have a matrix where the entries have moments 0, 1, 0, 3, then it will have square root of 2 over pi and times square root L ring roots with high probability. Now I take the Bernoulli, which have three moments, zero, one, zero, but the fourth moment is one. Can you prove the same thing that this very simple object, right? Imagine n by n plus, plus minus one matrix. Can you prove it have this many real root? Now we cannot, more embarrassingly, we cannot prove that it have two real roots. Right? Before I show you how to prove it had one real root, right? If n is odd, then any polynomial or body has one real root. So uh, if you can prove two, that's very nice. I could be impressed. Terry could be impressed too. We try. And, uh, and there are many other people who try. Yes? So in the first, in the second question, in your theorem with Terry, do you still have the same number, two, two, two or pi? Yes. It's, yeah. Once you have it, you have it exactly. So same. you have the same distribution. You have the same expectation, everything. When you don't have it, you have nothing. Yeah, that's just, uh, yeah. So this problem of two is really embarrassing. 
And it's very simple, abstract, right? Say no fancy thing here. Do n square coy flip, get the matrix. Prove that it has green eigenvalues. Uh, by now, the high probability, small probability. Yeah, for probably half, then probably it's not hard. But I want 0.99. Yeah, so it's the actually the simplest <laughs> question in this uh, whole thing that a anyone can understand, I guess, uh, and, and try. Uh, okay, let me talk a little bit about eigenvectors. So we spent a lot of time on eigenvalues already. Okay, so again, for eigenvector, it is simpler to talk about symmetric matrices because in linear algebra. We know that the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix form an autonomous basis, right? It's a very nice fact. And it is not true for non-symmetric matrices. So let me just focus on the symmetric case because of that. And OK, so um, we uh, normalize all the eigenvectors to have norm 1. And what you expect is an eigenvector should behave like a random factor from the unit sphere. What else could you expect? And it is totally true for the Gaussian case. You can prove this. That's actually the distribution is the uniform distribution on the sphere. Uh, we have, uh, well, so we try to prove this fact. Now for general, um, for general distribution. Uh, and one of the thing, one of the important parameter you can look at uh, from a vector is the is the infinity norm, right? Basically, the largest coordinate in the vector. Um, and if you have a random vector from the unit sphere, uh, actually you can prove that the infinity norm is of order. Well, of course, it have to be at least one over square root n, right? And you have to exceed it again by a factor of square root log n. So it's going to be square root of log n over square root n. Now, there are a lot of works. Actually, it's related to the universality of eigenvalue, showing that, again, you can have log sum of some power, like 1,000 to the n. Uh, so Ki and I, a few years ago, actually, it's basically the same paper. We can prove this right by square root log n over n. Um, and uh, Again, it worked for any sub-Gaussian model, namely the entry of sharp decay. So, for instance, it worked for the Bernoulli model. And you don't need any four moments here, just two moments. We conjecture that the distribution of this, uh, of this uh, infinity norm is universal, but yeah, right now, I think nobody has any clue to... to well, we run the experiment and it seems okay, but... Uh, but nobody has any idea to attack this. OK. Uh, so another parameter, uh, actually it's my favorite parameter from, uh, from linear algebraic courses I took 30 years ago. <laughs> it's, uh, well, I mean, it's bad to say that. I mean, you are old. But <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a determinant. OK, so we all know what the determinant of the matrix is. Uh, okay, something people, again, let me consider now the easier case. Here's the IID model, namely you have no symmetry. And you will see the reason for this very quickly. So I take an IID matrix with Gaussian entry. So you have n square Gaussian entries in the matrix. Look at the determinant. It turns out to satisfy the central limit theorem. Uh, but in rather tricky sense that, OK, the mean is I like look up n minus 1 factorial. And the standard deviation is very small. It's order square root log n. So the mean is huge, right? So you know that n factorial is sub-exponential. So the mean is sublinear of order n times log n, basically. But the variance is only order log n. It's very strongly concentrated. Uh, and OK, so here's a, something I can prove in one sentence. Uh, you know that the determinant 
Well, there's many ways to interpret it. First of all, it's a product of the eigenvalues. But there's a geometric interpretation of the determinant. You can see it's the volume of the parallel light pipe spanned by the row vectors, right? So in two dimensions, it's just a parallel, right? uh, you know, parallelogram. Now, if you use the base time high formula to compute the volume, then you basically multiply a bunch of numbers together, right? And now you take the log of the product, that will be sum of the log. So that's something appear to be the central limit theorem there because now you sum random variable. And the remarkable thing about the Gaussian is that this height are independent from each other. And now you sum independent random variable. And that, that gives you central limit theorem. That's the one line proof for the Gaussian case. So, well, when you don't have Gaussian, these random variables are correlated. Uh, but still, we uh, managed to prove with uh, Nguyen is my another former student that we have universality here as well. Um, and uh, only it means zero and variance one and some sub exponential theorem again. Uh, a few years ago, the people from anywhere actually replay the sub-exponential thing by just assuming that the fourth moment is bounded. It doesn't have to be three, it can be anything. It's just, it's just so we have uh, the universality for the law of determinant in the non-symmetric case. Uh, and why the non-symmetric case is easier because, as I said, we use the by, uh, if we use the interpretation of the determinant, that's volume, uh, and of the parallel like pipe as spanned by the rows, and the rows here are, in, are independent vectors, right? There's no symmetry in the matrix, so actually all the rows are independent. And that's very important in probability that we have independence. Now, what about dependent case? That, that approach will not work anymore. But again, people, there are two physicists, Delaney and Lacke here, uh, about 20 years ago, proved central limit theorem for the Gaussian setting. About like six years ago, Terry and I proved it, universality theorem, but now we do need the four moment assumption. So we go back to the case when we need the fourth moment to be three. And so, very simple question here, can you do it for Bernoulli matrices? Again, I have a symmetric plus minus one matrix. What is the law of the determinant? Very basic question. Nobody knows. All right, so let me end by something in, have with the, uh, you know, practical flavor. Uh, uh, this thing again doesn't work. Um, is a calculation with random noise. Um, okay, so first of all, calculation. Uh, we do a lot of things with data now. And for simplicity, I assume that the data is a matrix. Actually, it's not simplicity, it's the, that is the truth. And but of simplicity, I assume that is n by n matrix. Usually, they are rectangular matrices, but let me just make that simplification. And the size n is really huge. In practice, you can have n to be 10,000 or sometimes even over a million, depending on applications. I mean, any picture you took is already like a thousand by thousand matrix easily, right? You can have millions of pixels. That's the data. And now, of course, the data is noisy. Usually, when you process the data and compute with it, you don't compute with the real data, you compute with some perceived version of the data, right? Data plus noise. And so let's say N, MN is a noise which is random. And that's the best thing you can assume about noise, right? There's just nothing else you can talk, you, you can assume. Now, of course, the question is natural. When I compute with the data, I care about some critical parameters, say what is the first few eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's what we usually compute. Um, and that is true in so many fields, uh, from engineering to biology to statistics that I, I, 
I will not list the lib applications, but it's, it's enormous. Okay, so the question is that I have noise. How much noise will change the actual output? I want to measure something. The noise will change the output, so I may have error. How big is the error? Now, it's not my question. This is the question that have at least a hundred years story. It's, just, it's something called perturbation theory. That's the whole theory built up to deal with this kind of question. And you may have seen example like this. If you care about the spectral norm, namely the largest eigenvalue of the matrix, and then you have the very inequality that say that you look at the spectral norm of A plus noise, Compare the spectral norm of A, then the arrow tells me it must the spectral norm of the noise. Right. So namely the norm of A plus the norm of B is less than the norm of A plus the norm of B. Well actually it's, it's because it is a norm, it has to satisfy the triangle inequality. So this is just uh, one simple fact. And we know again from the picture that I show you at the be beginning, Mn is a normal line by square root n. And then the spectrum is between minus 2 and 2. Right? So the largest eigenvalue is roughly 2 times square root n. So under the assumption that the noise is, uh, well, I mean, if the model of noise is, uh, you know, reasonable in that sense, then the classical perturbation theory gives you the prediction that you can make an error as big as 2 times square root n. And sometimes it is too big because n is large, you know that. Right. Yeah, uh, but it is well know that this bow actually is, is sharp. There's a lot of examples of sharp. And there's a lot of other results in perturbation theory, like Davis Kahan and Wedding. Uh, they deal with the perturbation of eigenvectors. A key fan is that they deal with a different norm. So, yeah, you can. You can buy a lot of books about this. Uh, yeah, but now in practice, uh, what I uh, observe, or actually people observe uh, in recent years is that although the dimension of the data is huge, the data itself is often governed by a few parameters. So let me tell you an example. Uh, if the data is like a video stream of the person movement, well, this can have, uh, as I said, million and million of pixels. But the person movement is determined by the movement of the joints. Right? Like, uh, I sit here and move, but because my hip hurts, so basically the parameter is very small. Uh, uh, so it may be a 100 parameter or something. Another example is the, actually this uh, scoring of movies. So you, you rate movies, right? And you can have millions of people rating 10,000 of movies. So again, the dimension is huge. But actually, your rating is determined by very few things. Your gender, your age, your occupation, your race, a few hobbies. The people with the same profile usually rate the movie the same way. Uh, about five or six years ago, there was something called the Netflix Challenge. You know Netflix, right? So Netflix is the company you can order a movie and then pay them, and then you can rate the movie. They, re they release a partial rating. So the partial rating is a list of like 5,000 people rating I don't know, 5,000 movies. So it will have 25 million entries in this. They give you 2% of these entries and ask you to complete the rest. And uh, people who have the, the best match get a million dollars. So the million dollars motivate a lot of people entering this. And uh, it's quite a fun story that I think at the end, a team win and they match 80% or something. And they beat the second team by 20, 20 minutes. Second team have the same matching result. They submit their result later by 20 minutes. And they lost a million dollars. But the background of the algorithm they run is that they do assume low rank, right? You have a huge matrix. You know only 2% of the entries. I mean, there's no way you can complete the matrix without assume anything, right? And what they do assume is that the matrix have low rank. So that's another. Now when the matrix have low rank, okay, so we assume this, say the rank of the matrix is R, which is much smaller than N, maybe log N or maybe even constant. 
Uh, we found something interesting about eight years ago, is that the impact of the noise is no longer n-dimensional, it's r-dimensional. And so, example, is some recent, we have some recent uh, paper with uh, Sonoruk and Kivang here. We proved the following alternate of the Weibao. So let me go back to the Weibao here. So we have the norm of the sum less than the sum of the norm. But then the arrow term is the norm of mn, which is 2 times square root n. Right? Remember the right scaling is square root n. But now the impact of this is not the dimension anymore. It will be the rank. Actually, we can prove that the arrow term is no longer square root n, it's square root r, which is way smaller. And then that allows you to do a lot of things. So there's an application in data completion and recovery and clustering of complex networks, so based on this uh, better estimate. And uh, so uh, let me uh, end the talk with this application. And uh, yeah, I'm welcoming any questions. Yes. Just following this uh, finding, uh, how about the eigenvector bound? Yes, so eigenvector bound, we can also improve upon the Davis Kahan result. Namely, that usually eigenvector, eigenvalue bound, then the bound is the operator norm over noise divided by the gap, eigenvalue gap. And again, we can replace the square root n in the nominator by square root r. Yeah. And but there are a few correction terms and assumptions. So the answer there is slightly worse than this, but still much better than the classical theory. So the constant uh, might be get worse. Yes. And also there are some correction term that is sort of artificial. So um, earlier in the talk, where you, you were talking about the semicircle law and the, the spacing, you, you, you were sorry, you were looking at the number of eigenvalues within i or something, right? Yes, yes. Um, and I think you said that you can like log n over n or something. You could sort of look at yes. spacings up, um, or you can look at intervals um, of that. Um, what about if you have correlation matrices, where you know is there still um, is it still the same? the same situation, or do those numbers uh, change? If you look at the singular value, yes, of, okay. uh, of correlation matrices, the same thing hold. I okay. think we proved some that, something like that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, right. the covariance matrix, mm. yes. So it's not tied to the, you know, in any sense, to the semicircle law, it's basically. No, no, no. Is no. it tied to the fact that the eigenvalue spacings are on average 1 over n on the yes. order of 1 over n? Yes, okay. yes, yeah, so, right. Yeah, so most of the results I stay here have is parallel. Uh, for when we talk about symmetric matrices, then usually the same result hold for sample covariant matrices as well. But you have to look at the singular value, of course. Yeah. So uh, why is the fourth moment important in the, re uh, in the result of universality? Yeah, that is the tough question to answer. Let me go back to the central limit theorem, right? Central limit theorem, we need only two moments, right? But we have only n random variable, right? We had n random variable together. We need two moments. Now the matrix have n square random variable, so you need to square two, you get four. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the real answer. Um, Professor Wu, uh, many of the results uh, are, de are dealing with uh, asymptotics. It seems that there are several methods to do the asymptotics, some probabilistic method and uh, also so-called the Riemann-Hilbert method. Can you make some comment about the method and what methods are you using in your work? Uh, the Riemann-Hilbert method actually do very well with the Gaussian case and also very well with the case when you have an explicit joy distribution for the eigenvalues. Right? So the eigenvalues are yeah, you know, lambda 1 up to lambda n, then it's form a point in Rn, right? Now, if you have the explicit joy distribution of this measure in Rn, then the riemann hinbet uh, is good. But all these uh, matrices are, in some sense, they are given to you by the spectral measure already, right? So I give a matrix to you saying that, okay, I have a random matrix, and here's the joy distribution of the eigenvalues. 
So in our case, study here, we don't have that joint distribution. We have only the distribution of the entries, right? And the method have to be completely different. So it, the method Terry and I developed for proof universality is, uh, is a replacement method, namely that you start from any matrix. And one step at a time, you remove one entry and replace it by a Gaussian one. And then if you care about some statistic, you will measure how much the statistic change after you do one replacement, right? So you measure the error. And the error under the fourth moment assumption tends to be very small. So that even that you add n square error together, the total error is still small. So that's a method, it's a perturbation method. So it's a very different from the, the yeah, the, the riemann hinback method that you, you do things by hard analysis, uh, you know, computing things uh, yeah, directly. Thank you. So you mentioned the uh, real roots of the IID model is about square n. Yeah. What about imaginary roots? Of if you draw a straight line uh, intersect there, uh, circle, how many will line on them? Do you know that? That's the good uh, <laughs> question. I have no clue. <laughs> It was a pure uh, imaginary. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The pure imaginary root. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. I think people make that experiment for random polynomials, but but that's a different class of random function, and then they do find uh, pure imaginary roots, but I don't know. Well, uh, at least in the case when the entries are complex, then you can prove that there's no real root for random matrices. Now that is expected, right? And then it's also true as a theoretical result. But uh, yeah, but I don't know the answer to your question. All right, so uh, do you have any results on the smallest gap? So here is a conjecture from the biggest gap. So do you have any conjecture for the smallest gap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you show that? Yes, so again, the smallest gap have been pr computed in the Gaussian case, so the the average gap is one over n, and then I think the smallest one go down by a factor of n to the one third. And then of course we assume that universality will hold, but nobody proved anything uh, regarding that conjecture. So why the number of real roots is interesting to know? Uh, An application or? I think in applications, if you have a polynomial, the real roots usually play some role, right? Analytically, they tell things that you want to know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, from high school, I also have uh, the impression that people like the real roots of the polynomial. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> they teach us how to solve quadratic equation and when it have real roots. So, uh, yeah, but I think anal analytically. If the equation or the polynomial carries some physical meaning, then the real root does have some information. So I have a very difficult question. So you mentioned many conjecture for Bernoulli model, right? It seems nothing we know. Is there anything we know about Bernoulli uh, model? What do you mean by anything we know? Well, I mean, why Bernoulli model is so difficult? It, it, although the first moment method doesn't work, but uh, is there any uh, like uh, read the underlying why Bernoulli? Uh, well, models? first of all, from experience, when you can do Bernoulli, you can do most of the other. That's just experience because the method you develop to do with Bernoulli seems to generalize very easily. Uh, second, the Bernoulli is the discrete. Well, it's a typical discrete model. And the discrete model, it kills all the analytic techniques. So, uh -huh. so if you have an analytic technique to analyze a Gaussian, sometimes you can twist it a bit right. to analyze matrices with, with continuous distribution when the distribution, I mean, the density function is nice enough and regular and smooth and so on. Uh, you, you can do some kind of Fourier analytic kind of assumption there, but, but, but the Bernoulli just kills all this tactic too. So it's just a lack of tunes you deal uh -huh. with this. Okay. But in reality, actually it's the important one because uh, if you look at people in computer science and they deal with randomness a lot and noise a lot, it's, it's, it's the model they use because right. you know, you flip a coin, that's the yes. bit. Yes. 
Yeah, so uh, realistically, any model is discrete because if we compute with computer, there's no <laughs> continuous, right? Right. So for it's, me, it's even easier than a Bernoulli model, just plus one minus one, right? You don't have the. Yeah. Okay. So even from the practical point of view, it is the more important model than the. Okay. The Gaussian one, because uh, in reality we don't really have continuous distribution. Right. Okay, so let's thank Professor Wilkin.